do you do, everyone? Welcome to Human Humane Architecture on Think Tech Hawaii. I am the co-host of this program, DeSoto Brown, and our regular host is currently on vacation in Germany, the land of his birth, Martin Despang, but he is joining us today by Skype as we delve into yet more architectural history and uh, not just history, but architecture in Hawaii. Good afternoon, Martin. Hello, DeSoto. It's How's not, paradise? How's paradise? I miss paradise you guys. Is fabulous. Um, it's not. It's not afternoon for Martin. Everybody. He is uh, enjoying the pre-dawn darkness of Germany. But with the uh, rather tremendous time difference, Martin has to get up in the dimness of uh, the nighttime and to join us in the afternoon in Honolulu. So, tell us, Martin, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, if we can get picture one, I, I miss you guys and I miss paradise. And this is a glimpse of a piece of paradise on another island. This is Kauai. Yeah. And um, this is, you know, what Germans by default think of paradise. Our culture is very confined, both climatically. We had like 60 something degrees yesterday and it can swing. It goes to 80 and 90. And we're also, I guess, culturally a little confined as everything is pretty dense here and it's all built. And so we dream of uh, tropical islands, you know, and we've been doing this for a while, if you can get picture too. I'm, I've moved on to the north of Germany and I'm tuning in from the Casa Kleinschmidt. That's uh, my best friend, Pell from school, is uh, hosting me temporarily when I'm, whenever I'm here. And he actually got me this DVD you see on, on picture two, which is Blaues Hawaii. And his father was a chef and he had a restaurant at a forest and he told me they served the Hawaii toast. <laughs> Isn't that something? To yeah, say? so the, the, the so-called Hawaii toast is here on the screen right now for everyone to see in the upper right corner. And that is a piece of white bread that's toasted, has a piece of ham on top of that, and then on top of that a slice of pineapple and a bright red cherry. And not only was that popular in Germany, but there were other things in the United States that were using ham and uh, pineapple in a similar way. And then we also just read recently of the death of the man who purportedly invented the pizza with a Hawaiian mm -hmm. pineapple topping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the lower exactly. right corner. And, and, the, and that movie, which is obviously still sold here in, in Germany because Blau is Hawaii, means Blue Hawaii. Right. And so the, the legacy of that movie portraying uh, a, a pioneering um, a tourist uh, Hawaii um, is, is still, you know, you can still buy it, obviously. And we had actually shown uh, glimpses of uh, that particular movie at the beginning of our collaboration. We were talking about the uh, international marketplaces. Yes. And at yes. the very beginning, it, it plays in downtown uh, booming Honolulu at that time. But today we want to talk about how actually the movie uh, closes and finishes. And, and to that regards, can we get number three? Uh, there was a building, because this show is also about architecture, there was a building uh, built around that time. And can you explain what we see on picture three? Well, in the first picture, we saw the Cocoa Palm Grove on the island of Kauai, which in 1950 hosted the first hotel on that site, which was called the Cocoa Palm Lodge, very small, 24 rooms, five employees. In 1950, it got turned into the Cocoa Palms Hotel Resort Hotel. Hotel. And the photo we're looking at here is later on in that time period. This is in the 1960s, and the resort grew very dramatically from the 50s into the 60s, and it was all the, the mind, out of the mind of the owner and uh, manager of the hotel, which was a woman named Grace Bushlander. And she came up with a tremendous amount of interesting ways to promote the hotel and make it a different and wonderful sort of faux or um, fantasy Polynesian experience. And so there's mm -hmm. our cocoa palms right there. And we Germans were eating it up, as you can see on the next picture, and actually the couple following pictures too, where uh, I learned through you, and this is from your tremendous archive, 
that you collect these things that you know they the marketing directors were making redoing the covers of um, for, for the movie the posters over and over again and these are all German ones as one can yeah. tell Great. As one is familiar with the German language correct and it was and in uh, the, yeah. the, the movie was a hit all over the world, which is something we're going to see a little bit later on, too. That's true. And in 2014, that's the next picture, I happened to be in Kauai, and I drove by. And we have to say the hotel is not anymore the way you just described it, because in uh, the early 90s, uh, Hurricane Iniki, and the hurricane season just started, so I hope you guys stay safe by the time I'm here, um, plowed through, and ever since, the, 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 the hotel was out of commission. And, and, and there were several attempts over the years to reopen it. In 2014, I was able to take this picture because that iconic lobby structure was still there, which even more sadly, uh, I think the year after uh, they put it on fire, some vandals uh, uh, basically did that. that. That's a very sort of iconic uh, piece that's by one of our favorite architects from the shows Pete Wimberly who in the last show we talked whenever he had the chance to do some more buildings with more public experience he was more getting into the ticky while other more institutional types he was dealing more in uh, a modern a modern tradition correct that's right uh, and let's go and see some more of these uh, mo uh, movie poster pictures yeah, so right. number so our six. Next picture there we are again in Germany Germany uh, took to Elvis very much just like the USA did Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and architecturally, so number seven, the next picture is actually how that entrance uh, looked in, in its original way. Right. And, and, and you taught me that this iconic tower is actually alluding and referring to uh, some indigenous uh, tectonics and way of building. But of yes. course, as Pete was doing it, he was not mimicking it as we some do these days, but he was interpreting that. Correct. And that tower was based on something that was a structure that was found in significant Hawaiian heiaus or temples for the native Hawaiian mm -hmm. religion. And uh, they're called an oracle tower. This, and as you said, mm -hmm. this is not an identical version, but that's what it's based on. And the building behind it, which is the lobby you were just describing, is again not an actual Polynesian structure replicated, but instead it is a modern American style, Polynesian style structure that is based on some authentic indigenous uh, architecture in other parts of the Pacific, but it is still very much of the modern age in uh, the Hawaiian Islands and the USA. And this sort of adoption of, of culture and the the nature of the exotic, we just got overly excited about yesterday in prepping for the show, which results in probably a couple of shows about that. And we, to the very right, you see what kind of car in that picture. Just above the Think Tech Hawaii logo, which just vanished, you can see a little Volkswagen Beetle. And that comes from the land where Martin's speaking to us from now. And Volkswagen Beetles were tremendously popular in the USA and here in the Hawaiian Islands very much. And we could get all uh, involved in that, but I don't think we have time for that and, today. And, and we all, because you told us a couple of shows ago, you, you rolled over in one. I certainly so. did. Yeah, personal memory. So number eight is, is once again another, another, so they couldn't even stop. They, they redid the covers of the posters, you know, over and over again. Really sort of unique was, must have been, because I never saw it, um, uh, was was the lobby of, of that building. So this is number nine, and I subtitled that the Voodoo Lounge. So For they were really reason. playing off this sort of, not just exotic, but this sort of mystical, notion, you know, they created these weird, uh, you know, lights and lamps and, and basically customized um, uh, the whole thing, this sort of, you know, fantasy, illusion, perception, dream, obsession of what people would think, what the strange plays half around the world Correct. might be, what they wanted it to be, right? Right, and, and it's a mixture of the modern and the primitive, and that was something that was mm -hmm. very popular at that time period. Now, you referred to this as the tiki, that's the voodoo lounge, and that is referring to the fact that there was a movie that was made, another movie made at the Coco Palms Resort, it was called Voodoo Island from 1957, and in fact, the Coco Palms promoted itself as 
as being a major movie location because in addition to Blue Hawaii and Voodoo Island, there was also a film called Sadie Thompson, another one called South Pacific, or not South Pacific, but um, Pagan mm -hmm. Love Song. And uh, one of the yeah. structures that was on the grounds was built for the film Sadie Thompson, and then they left it there as a, as a chapel, as a wedding chapel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And talking weddings, let's go to jump to picture number 10, which uh, shows us two posters from two other cultures where this was also popular Absolutely. or populated. Both. And uh, on the right is a Japanese poster, Blue Hawaii is what it's titled in Japanese phonetically. And on the left is the cover of a magazine from South America, which shows the really iconic final scene of the film Blue Hawaii, which is this wedding in which Elvis and his girlfriend Miley Duvall are married. They are riding on a barge, which is on one of the lagoons on the property of the Coco Palms, and dressed in Hawaiian style with um, some Kauai people in the background as extras uh, attending them at their wedding. And this was a hugely influential scene. People were really sucked in mm -hmm. by the romance of this and the location where it happened. Mm -hmm. And as we like to zoom in and, and look at the details, if you can get number 11, even to me, surprisingly, me dreaming of exotic, I was thinking, you know, Hawaii would have huge shells on the beach, and it doesn't. So they actually went to, I think it was Tahiti, and got these huge shells, and they used them for the sinks in the rooms. Right. And you were you were guessing in which particular part of the hotel that I'm was, and for that we sure. could bring in the number 12, which is also the permanent background picture. Correct. There were nine of these freestanding cottages. There were five called the King's Cottages and four called the Queen's Cottages. And these figure very prominently in the Blue Hawaii film that we've been talking about. I believe that those shell um, basins were only used in these cottages, which I think must have been the high end part of the accommodations. And you also saw in the previous picture that the shells were backed up by this gold, shiny gold tile, which I think was Mm -hmm. to add elegance to what must have been the premier uh, accommodation. Exactly. The hotel and once again, all the way through the detailing, which is perfectly described, this mixed, mixed combination between modern, so having you know a sink, having running water, is is truly an achievement of modern society. But then again, using this archaic natural big thing is is basically the primitive right absolutely and, and there's and, and there's we, another uh, detail that that struck me in the movie and this is number 13 if we can jump to that one and we had our tech guys at school thank you guys do these screenshots there's this final scene where miley who is uh, Elvis's girlfriend got really upset with him and she expresses that through a sh slamming close these vertical wooden louvers and you can see on the right is another r view of the room. And in fact, the room on the right in the postcard is in a separate building um, on the grounds of the Coco Palms Hotel, which was referred to as the Blue Hawaii Building. And it had blue interior decor in honor of the movie. But of course, the, the point here is the architectural touch of the vertical louvers, the natural um, ventilation that they offer, not to mention mm. that they are a striking architectural detail too. Yeah. So you said there was this modern comfort that the American and global tourists requested, yes. but it was camouflaged and hidden in number four, picture number 14 in these in these cottages. They were pretty much like blending with, with nature and, right. and, and that kind of stuff. Let's go to one more detail, which is number 15, because what's really striking, what usually only corporate hotels do, they design everything, the total piece of artwork, down to the little accessoires and accessories here, which is an ashtray, and I believe it's a letter opener, right? Talking branding to the best, right, Absolutely. to the max. And this is not something that uh, is done all that frequently just because of the cost. I mean, it's only the high-end mm -hmm. hotels that are going to do this. And it's also of a time when people wanted Polynesian or exotic-themed souvenirs. So the ashtray is supposed to look like a woven laohala or coconut frond hat. And if you turn it mm -hmm. over on the other side, it says Coco Palms Hotel. And that's the type of thing people liked in those days. Yeah, and they did the same to the architecture. Next picture, they took that sort of very typical Moby American pool 
and basically tropicized it by giving it a sort of edge out of lava rock, which you said, imagine, you know, it was probably not very practical, not very nice to walk on, but right. it's it, it, this makes like a generic chlorine pool look exotic and and that's the way they did it with with everything in in the building uh, the the ultimate scene in the movie the portraying is number 17 which as you mentioned already is that wedding ceremony where everything accumulates and and you see the celebration and that sort of match between between the cultures and this is the legacy of of the of the of the hotel both as as the movie and we just went online to see what the current status is and uh, now the the project seems under redevelopment and we, we there's a website of the developer and if we can get number 18 this is how the architect portrays the cottages and right. and i we were when we were discussing this we were a little shocked we were saying well this has little to do with the original uh, cottages which intention was almost to be invisible yes. this year reminded me of uh, of of alani and the residential part these are pretty much american structures they're once again Polynesianized by Chevron guardrails, but little to nothing to do with the original. And I don't know what's going on on the roofs up there, if that's some kind of thatching, uh, which the original buildings obviously had. Underneath, of course, they probably just had corrugated metal roofs for mm -hmm. ease of care. And, um, I think in this case, what I can see is the, the this very interesting term of value engineering. I think the thatch got value engineered, and these are pretty much generic, uh, ordinary structures that once again have little, you know, ornaments here and there. And again, number 19 is what, what it used to look like where, you know, I'm thinking it's almost like uh, the architecture was swallowed by the jungle. Yep. And again, tourists came and that's what they wanted to see. They didn't want to see structures that they were familiar with. They wanted to see stuff that was exotic that they didn't know. Correct. Right. And the hotel was developed in a setting of that you couldn't replicate. It was a, a huge palm grove that was already there, plus the lagoons were already there. They just fit in the structures into this incredibly beautiful natural environment. Exactly, and that's why we were increasingly shocked when we went to the next slide on the website, number number 20 here, which is almost like the jungle is now swallowed by the architecture. Yes. I mean, you see, you know, lots of buildings. You see a palm tree here and there, which is almost contradictory to um, to the original concept. And, and you said perfectly, you know, if you have this legacy, why not building upon it? Because there's a market and there's competition, and if you can distinguish yourself, we talked about this crazy German word Alleinstellungsmerkmal, which means it's something that distinguishes you from other things. Why not doing that? Yeah. So we were thinking here again. I mean, the development probably goes on, but whoever sees the show, maybe there are some suggestions what you what you could do. And with number 21, we've been using cars as vehicles for thought for a while. And I want to share this one here from my archives, which I use, again, cars to think about architecture a lot. And there's this gentleman, which I think he had a place somewhere in Hawaii. This is Neil Young, uh, obviously, for all the old folks like us knowing, and the young folks look him up. He's a legend, too. And he, talking legend, he owns a 59 Lincoln Continental. And he said, this is iconic, this is unique, this is total piece of artwork. So I'm going to transition this into the future, and I'm going to do this uh, with a team of mechanics. I'm going to convert what is not up to date anymore, which is the engine of the car, which probably has a gas mileage of three miles per gallon, and probably. they turned it into a hybrid with 30 miles per gallon. So it's uh, he calls it link vault. Yep. And I what see. does this have to do with architecture potentially? Maybe gets more clear on number 22, which is um, I said I moved on to northern Germany. We have not that much wood as in the south. So we use uh, vernacularly tectonics. They're not unsimilar to how you folks used to do it and using a, a you know a, a wooden post every once in a while we call this half timbered uh, uh, tectonics so there was a 300 year farmhouse that was threatened to be demolished by the clients and we converted it and adapted it to their contemporary needs 
and we did it in a very radical way and we, we thought we need to do it in an equally innovative way as the people you know were very innovatively building this 300 years ago so we kept the mindset the methodology of innovation which then by nature couldn't result in in you know retrofitting the building back to its original stage it, it looked differently it got a new spatial and thermal threshold of uh, you know triple glazed uh, glass so it's highly energy efficient and we just thought this is the way that people would have done it 300 years ago if they would have had the means now, did and you so, totally disassemble you know, the structure and rebuild it, or did you keep the framework as is? We, we kept, and this is, let's go to number 23, because there it comes apparent why I make this connection here. This was me, and uh, two years later, last year, 2016, driving by, and by that time, the developer had started to gut the building, so to take out all the, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, it's a concrete frame structure, so the building actually get, didn't get entirely destroyed by Iniki, but everything that was light infill, like the roof and the facades got damaged, and, you know, my feel feeling is to Soto that in the early 90s, you know, Tiki wasn't really that chic anymore. This is actually why the one of the major, you know, Tiki researchers started to look into that, as you told me, and you got excited about it. Because, um, you know, it was it was sort of not the style of the time in Newport. People didn't like it. So I'm pretty sure reopening the hotel in that same fashion, so to speak, didn't seem to be opportune anymore. And they might have just cashed in the insurance money and didn't do anything. That's all speculative. But now you can see the bare bones. So the question is, you know, what do you do with bare bones? And we had the same. We got at the thing. We had to, you know, take out some uh, wooden posts that were rotting away. We were cleaning it up, but then we needed to get more light into there. So we took out some of the sodbreg infill and replaced it with glass. We pushed it back. We created lanai. So sort of a creative, uh, you know, interpretive kind of method to do that. So here's some ideas. We always close with some potentially, you know, weird and interesting ideas about what could you do. And this is number 24, which these are two examples from my emerging colleagues that I have the privilege to work with who actually get excited what you can see about vertical wooden louvers again. Right. So and there's I uh, see that there's, there's this going sort of idea that. about we're in the tropics. So why not basically, you know, as you said before, a wooden louver has the potential to let the breeze through. Right. And basically feel I'm in paradise. Right. And in the photo, I can see that there's dry ice vapor that's going through those vertical louvers showing the air movement. Exactly. So we tested that, we prototype it, and, and it's just sort of a rediscovering of of, um, not necessarily sort of original, once again, uh, vernacular things, but interpreting that just like Pete Wimberly has been doing it, you know, saying, you know, we got we got woods, but we don't, we have invasive species, we might repurpose these, we might apply different technologies to process that. So there's a whole sort of range that you could, you could make it again, um, specific to the culture and, um, you know, not doing the fake thing, talking Alani again. If you go to Alani, you knock on what looks like wood and it's fiberglass, but mm -hmm. you don't notice until you do that. And who knocks on buildings? You know, not everyone, you know, woodpeckers maybe, right. but, you know, the woodpecker is probably pretty upset, right? Because he <laughs> needs wood, he likes wood, and he packs on plastic. That's kind of uh, irritating, isn't it? <laughs> well, fortunately, we don't have woodpeckers here, so that's not going to happen at Alani. Oh, okay. In Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe we go to the final picture here, which is like, well, so um, our um, other buddy, uh, Kurt Sandburn, our investigative and activist reporter, uh, was sending this to us, and and he said, hey, uh, look what's happening actually pretty close to me here. The picture at the bottom is actually the proposed uh, Google headquarters in London, uh, United Kingdom, by the currently very um, uh, well-in-business uh, designer and architect Thomas Heatherwick. 
And look what he's doing. Look yep. what he's proposing. There are the vertical louvers, which we not only saw in the scene at uh, the Coco Palms Hotel in Blue Hawaii, but we also saw them on our favorite building, the Ala Moana building, which had them back in 1961 that changed their position according to the time of day to provide shade to the interior of the building. And that was high tech back in 61, and now it's, as you said, it's ironic to see one of the most powerful companies in the entire world constructing a building in the 21st century that's using that same technology that we've already seen. Exactly. So this is a this is probably a stretch, but we now are we saying Pete Wimberly, our tropical tiki architect in Hawaii, has you know inspired uh, the hotshot architect Thomas Hedewick in a way, you know, I, maybe he doesn't know, maybe he doesn't know, maybe he doesn't but what know, he really but tells us is that there is a tremendous tradition of innovation on the Hawaii Islands, yes. not only originally, indigenously, but also sort of um, over the years, especially yes. mid-century, there was, there was really, people were really trying hard and doing the best to tiptoe, you know, and walking on these, you know, eggs of like, you know, being respectful of the culture, but also bringing the best of their culture. Yes, and I think that is, you and I have discussed this before, the Hawaiian Islands are physically very small and physically very separated from the rest of the world, and yet the influence is spread internationally in lots of different ways, culturally as well as technology and all kinds of things. So that's something we can be proud of and excited about. Exactly, and we're gonna dive a little deeper in about two weeks because we're on a two week schedule and we're gonna look into crazy candlelivering canopies, yes, which is actually are. one of your little things that you get, you're excited about and you got me excited about and that's how it works between us. So I'm looking right. forward to that. Right. I think we're out of time for today, so. I go back to sleep, and you have a good rest of the day, DeSoto. Uh, thank you very much, and I will be going back to work and sending you pictures of the kooky tropical canopies that uh, we'll be looking at when we get back together two weeks from now. And so until that two-week time comes up again, everybody, um, we'll be saying aloha from Human Humane Architecture, Martin from Germany, Mean from Honolulu, and see you next time.